All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session. My notes out. So, um, my name is Taylor. I'm the Student Experience Officer at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. Uh, and I'd like to just quickly start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands in which we are all on and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, so today we'll be hearing from Dr. Um, Stefan Muller, Miller, um, the Deputy Principal at Haylibury and Anita Nichols, the Talent Acquisition Manager also at Haylibury. Um, so Stefan and Anita will be discussing the independent sector, sharing, sharing lots of their knowledge and experiences and tips and tricks today. Um, so it's quite an informative session. Um, I will just also let you know if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat function and we'll be able to discuss those at the end of the session. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to send me a personal message in the chat function. Um, but I'll hand over to Stefan and Anita now go through the session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Taylor. Much appreciated and, uh, and welcome everybody. I'm, uh, I'm delighted so many of you are, are turning up to, uh, to listen to us present to you on, on our, our uh, advice and experiences in how to find employment in this weird and strange year that you're all going through. Now, I, I do need to say right from the very beginning, you know what it's like in education by now. When you ask 10 people their opinion on a matter in education, you get about 15 opinions back. So what we're telling you is our experience, um, but it, uh, it stands to reason that Halebury is the largest independent school in the country uh, and one of the largest employers in education, therefore has uh, extensive experience. And therefore we, we do have something to add to this discussion. We'd love to answer your questions uh, at the end. And then of course there's avenues and means of reaching out further to us if anything else uh, pops into your mind as we go through. So what I think we should do is uh, just outline very briefly what the session is about and then who's talking about what. Uh, we'll talk about the context, Halebury in the independent sector, some myths that are still pervasive in education, uh, the job search itself, how to find ads, what the ads mean, what research you need to do to make sure you're best positioned to apply, your application, the do's and the don'ts, and those technical bits of our talent acquisition and our recruitment processes. Anita, Halebury's uh, talent acquisition manager, whose sole role is to, to make the candidate experience the best it can be and to support our school to find the very best people for our students. Uh, we'll talk through those. Uh, what the school, like ours, are looking for people, uh, for looking for in people. What the interview process looks like, what the selection process more widely than the interview, the, the uh, observation lessons and the uh, confirmation interviews, etc., look like. What you might want from a school, what a school needs to be like for you to be professionally at home there. And then at the very end, if we have time, um, some, uh, some pointers and hinters for uh, the dreaded bit at the end of the interview where the panel chair leans back and goes, so nervous candidate, do you have any questions for us? And, uh, and we'll give you some, some hinters and some, uh, some pointers there. I should point out this entire session came about because a few years back when we had just appointed an absolutely outstanding graduate teacher into a full-time ongoing teaching position, uh, I was chatting with her over coffee during induction and she told me that she was at a, at a careers fair and she was talking to a, an agency uh, and she said at the time that she had applied to Halebury and the person whose job it was to help people in education recruitment said uh, words to the effect of well good luck with that it's not like schools uh, like that take graduates very often. And that made me really angry when she told me because she was absolutely outstanding. She was a fine educator. She is now one of our very finest teachers and always was going to be. And we proudly and happily employed her. And we didn't give her a fixed term or a six, six month trial. We offered her the job she'd applied for, which is a permanent ongoing role. And schools like ours do look for the best teachers and not graduates and not people with experience per se. It's always about student outcomes. So this presentation, these thoughts that I'm going to tell you arose from that brief conversation where somebody had been given the impression that schools like ours don't look for people like you and nothing could be further from the truth. So um, before I do anything else, uh, I wanted to point you at this uh, source of information for you. This is a report from ASA, the Australian Council for Educational Research. It's slightly dated now, it's from 2015, 
but uh, a lot of the trends, tendencies, and underlying uh, factors uh, for the workforce for teachers in Australia still very much hold true and it points you at other sources of information. It talks about teacher training, part-time, full-time, retention rates, dropout rates for different sectors um, and how and what they look for and it'd be a really really useful short very readable report for you all to download from the ASA website uh, and they get periodically updated. So if you haven't come across this yet I would very warmly recommend that you go and have a look at that because it gives you a, a slightly zoomed out um, global look at the uh, workforce planning and recruitment situation for teachers generally in, uh, in Australia from having said all that uh, five years ago. So I want to bust a couple of myths before Anita talks you through some of the, the detail of what we do. Here is what's often perceived to be a, a truth, which is this, that if you plot years of experience in teaching against the quality of your classroom practice, there's this, this notion that if you are uh, inexperienced, you can't be particularly good. And the longer you stay in the position, inevitably there's this linear progression through your quality of teaching, whereby at the end of the, uh, the you know, first 10 or 20 or whatever many years it is that you spend in this noble profession, you will be then a master expert and uh, experienced teacher. Now, that is a complete myth. That just simply isn't true. The reality in a typical staff room looks more like this, where of course there are some teachers who don't have very much experience and whose teaching could do with a whole bunch of improving. There are some teachers who are, however, very new to teaching and are some of the finest educators you will ever find because teaching at its heart is a relational business. If you have student outcomes first and foremost and you've acquired in your masters of teaching the techniques and tools that you need to have an impact on young people and you are passionate and skilled at creating the relationship that underpins all learning, then you may well not have much experience, but be an absolutely outstanding teacher who makes a real difference to students' life. And of course, there are teachers who have served for a very long time and who are absolutely outstanding educators. These people here. And sadly, however, there are plenty of teachers who've done it for far too long, who've bumped along the bottom, who might have been in the business for many, many years, and who have got nothing to give to you other than cynic, cynical sniping from the sidelines, who shouldn't be teachers anymore. So this is much more the reality of a, of a common room, if you like. So what I'm really interested in actually is not talking about the, the global picture of everybody in the profession, but your journey, what you're here to do and the people that we're looking for in recruitment. So you might be one of these people. You might start lowly and go put that down to not having much experience, but actually your mindset might not be the right one. You might simply hope that you'll just get better by lasting, by simply toughing it out and staying in the role. Teaching is not for you. If you're this person who just hangs on in there and who hasn't got a mindset for learning and being the best learner in the room to help your students be the best learners, no matter what you teach them, you're on the wrong job and you should probably drop out of this uh, presentation right now. This might be you and you can start okay and you can stay okay for many, many years of experience and that's serviceable, but it's not who we're looking for. It's probably also not what you should be doing with your life to just stay at that level and just try and last. That works, but it doesn't work very sustainably for most people. This might be you and that's great. You might have not very much experience in the teaching space, of course, because you're graduate teachers and early careers teachers. You may have lots to learn, but you are acknowledging that you have lots to learn and you are confident that you know how to learn and you're willing and happy to engage. And we are looking for people just like this, whereby through your years with us or with another school, you get better and better and better at what you do. Or you might be this sort of person, like the graduate teacher that I employed, uh, as, I, as I referenced earlier, a few years ago, who was absolutely outstanding right from the off. She walked into the classroom and you knew she was a great teacher. And she had very little experience, but she had brilliant potential and brilliant impact right from the first day. And yet she's still learning more. And yet she's still improving what she does. And yet she's still learning from and with and for others. And that's the sort of person that you want to be, that you probably all can be given your background and, uh, and the degree you're just about to finish. And that's when you know you're on the right school. So that's what we're really interested in. Now, I'm going to throw over to Anita, but I want to tell you just a couple of seconds um, worth of what Anita's role is. So Anita's role in Halebury is relatively new and Halebury being a very progressive and very large school with four campuses and four and a half thousand students and a thousand staff just in Melbourne. 
uh, plus a school in the Northern Territory, plus two schools in China and about 10 other programs across Southeast Asia, has now grown to the sort of complexity, size and scale and quality that makes a talent acquisition manager a worthwhile role to have. So Anita looks after the entire process from workforce planning with our executives to the advertisement, to candidate screening, the interview process, and, uh, and works then into the induction process for those who are successfully appointed with the candidates and the, uh, the hiring managers, the, the, the heads of the school, the heads of the campus. So what Anita doesn't know about recruitment probably isn't worth knowing. And I'm gonna to throw to her now to talk you through how we get to advertising a position and what sort of research you need to do and why it might be worth applying to us through a different route, even if we don't have a perfect position for you. And then I'll take over to tell you a little bit more about what to bring off yourself to an application. Anita, over to you. Thank you very much for that, Stefan, and um, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, so as um, Stefan just mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about um, the advertisement and, and background research. So um, as you may be aware, Halebury do not advertise um, or we don't have a formal graduate program as such. Um, and that's not to say that we are not um, open to, um, to hiring graduates um, within the school. So um, I just wanted to go through a couple of things with you this morning um, around um, what you need to do and what the expectation is um, when researching um, a school such as Halebury. So every um, position within Halebury, um, we advertise externally and sorry, I lie, we don't advertise every position externally, but the majority of them we do. Um, with regards to a job description, and I'm sure many of you are, are aware of what a job description is, um, the purpose of a job ad is to um, inform potential job candidates, just, um, as, uh, just like candidates like yourself, about a new opening and to, um, to attract candidates and good quality candidates um, like all of you to apply. So it's really, really important as a prospective um, employee to, to really um, look at the job description and, and understand what it is we are looking for. So for example, you know, we will often see uh, candidates come through that have no relevance to that particular role. So, you know, they, they don't go through to the next stage. You really need to tailor your background and experience and the areas in which you want to work with the job ads that you're, you're applying for. So have a really good understanding of not just the job ad, but also the organisation that you're applying for. So with regards to Halebury, we highly recommend that you have a look at our website and re really familiarise yourself with who we are and what we do and have a really good understanding of the school. Uh, it might be worth also um, applying through other avenues. If that particular role, if we had a classroom teacher role, if that wasn't right for you, um, applying through an expressions of interest avenue on our, um, on our website. So we currently have a, an ex expression of interest um, job that is open, um, um, that's, that's open all of the time, um, which you could send through um, your application to if there are no specific positions available. Um, get to know um, myself, get to know Stefan, get to know people within the school. Uh, connect with them on LinkedIn. I think that's a really good way to, um, to network and, and let people know that you are really and gen genuinely interested in um, a position at, at Halebury. Um, my role, I guess, um, in 2021 will be to start developing talent pools and creating talent communities where we can um, start having conversations um, even when there aren't positions uh, available. So really just um, keeping in the loop with any talent pools that are created and we'll be asking you to join our talent community. Um, so um, just in summary there, really network with some key um, contacts within the school. Um, feel free to reach out to myself as well and, and get in touch with me and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, around a particular role um, and really understand um, the job advertisement and what it is they are actually um, asking for. And uh, thank you, Anita. And that was, uh, there was a question just there uh, about advice for graduate psychologists. That applies to any and every position that we advertise, whether it's in the corporate space, whether it's in the educational space, whether it's mm -hmm. in the student or staff support space, we tailor our positions really, really closely for exactly what we need. 
So we have a, a large and, and outstanding team of, uh, of psychologists, for example, who help our, our uh, teachers and our school leaders with uh, the, the student welfare provisions that we need to and want to put in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are a graduate psychologist and we're advertising for a school psychology position, there's absolutely nothing to stop you from applying. We will never advertise just for graduate on the following basis. We're looking for fine educators. Now, there may be a team with a, a, a bunch of very experienced teachers where we might actively welcome the new uh, tools, techniques, uh, knowledge, tech understanding that a particular early careers or graduate teacher might bring to it. And we might actively be looking for an early careers teacher for that particular team. We might have a professional team at another campus that has already got a, a, a large complement of relatively early careers teachers. And for that particular circumstance, we might then be looking for somebody with more experience, not because the experience is better per se, but because it adds to that particular team and that subject at that campus and that school in those circumstances, what we're looking for. And those are the conversations that Anita will have with a head of campus before we even advertise. And so that phone call to Anita outlining to her, who you are and how you might fit in is really, really important. And that's why we don't have a blanket policy on who we're looking for. We're looking for the best educator for our students in that circumstance at that time. And that and leads if, me to... Oh God, I'm sorry, I was going to say, if I, can, if I can quickly add to that, we currently have a psychologist position available at our city campus. So, uh, you know, my job as a talent acquisition manager is to look at all of the applications and present back to um, the head of campus around who we have identified. So um, if that happens to be a, 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 you know, a fantastic graduate, then so be it. So my recommendation is to, um, if you think that you would like to apply, um, by all means do it. There you go, and question worth asking. And that leads me on to this thing here, the, the questions that you need to ask yourself, because sometimes there's, there's some more myths around the place that, that uh, we as a school that is in the independent sector and therefore derives some of our funding from parental contributions would be, would be running much more like a business, that we might be interested in schools because they're in graduates because they're cheaper or because at this time of the year, lots of you come into the jobs market and we don't have to try particularly hard to find you or because you might be so grateful for a job that, that a school that is of, a, of an ilk like ours with, uh, with excellent academic outcomes, even though we're non-selective with uh, you know, an extensive sport, art, music and drama program program uh, can chuck anything your way and you won't complain because you're happy to have a job. And if that sounds cynical and brutal, well, that's because it would be if it was true. But we don't operate like that. And any school where you get the sense that they're just skimming, skimming the cream off the top in terms of getting you for cheap and then you can, they can do with you what you like, you shouldn't be working for because you will not last in education because education is a really tough job. It's the finest job you'll ever do but it's a really tough job to engage with young people and imbue in them a love for learning. So you can ask some questions of the schools that I will uh, talk you through later to get a, a hunch for the culture that a school maintains, not just for the students and the parents, but also for the staff. So um, uh, if I forget to do that, then do ask me later. So the advertisement and the, uh, the background research that you should do. If you want to know about a job being suitable for you, you really need to learn more about the school. And of course, a website like ours will be full of effectively, let's be honest, advertising material to project the school into the marketplace. But there will still be hints in there about the sorts of programs we run and the sort of uh, support that we offer that will make it obvious whether it's a place for you or not. So for example, at Hellerby, there's an expectation that academic members of staff from middle school upwards get involved in the Saturday morning sporting program. If you love netball and you've played netball at a really high level and you see that we offer netball amongst our 32 sports and you would love to get involved in that because it rounds out your professional experience, that's brilliant. If you absolutely do not want to have anything to do with sport and you can see your Saturday morning spent doing something wholly different, well then Hellerby is probably not the school for you. And that's fine too. We don't pretend to be the school for everyone, but you do need to look uh, in, in particular at the sort of place that you're applying for. The same goes for any other independent school too. So you need to shape your cover letter, such as it is asked for, to the school and to the position you're applying for. And you should tell us, so to speak, what you give or what you bring to your application and the position, rather than telling us what we need. And by that, I mean that sometimes I see a cover letter, half of which talks about what it takes to be a good biology teacher. 
We know what it takes to, go, to, to be a good biology teacher. We've got 600 full-time academic staff. We have the most outstanding biology teachers in the country. We don't need to be told what it takes to be a good biology teacher. What I do want to know when I read your cover letter is why you are the best biology teacher for us in that point, uh, in that campus at that time. So that's a subtle, a subtle difference where you need to project yourself rather than uh, telling us what it is that we need. So I'm gonna hand back over to Anita to talk you through what really is key about putting in the cover letter and in particular also in the CV. Now, some of what we tell you might diverge slightly from what you've been told by others. That's okay, we all have our own opinions, but this is in our experience, what works really well when very, very busy heads of campus and school executives have a great many applications. And in the last four years, Henry's received nearly 20,000 applications. It's entirely routine for us to get 90 to 100 applications for a teaching position uh, in one of the main subjects, English, uh, humanities, maths, PE, et cetera, at one of our campuses. So you do need to stand out, but without overcooking it. Anita, over to you for this. Thank you, Stefan. And you make a really good point. You do need to stand out. Uh, I, I get asked the question a lot, um, do I need to submit a cover letter? And the answer to that is yes, you do. You absolutely do. Does your cover letter need to be five or six pages long? No, the expectation is not that you, we wanna hear your whole life story in your cover letter. We um, expect, or our expectation is that your cover letter will be short, um, it'll be clear, it'll be concise, um, and it will be personal. I think, you know, and I look at a lot of cover letters every day, the ones that really stand out to me are the ones that uh, do things like linking their own values to those of our school. Um, what we want to see in, in your cover letter is passion. And believe me, we can really, really see that come out of a cover letter when you talk about your passion for what you do. Um, it really stands out um, in, in your cover letter. So we don't want to just sort of um, have you address the selection criteria in your cover letter. And, you know, I wish to apply for a position at Halebury um, because we see so many of those. So really get creative with those um, and really have, you know, and, and I think Taylor, I think Stefan touched on this earlier, really Taylor a cover letter to the job that you're applying for. It is okay to have three or four different cover letters that you use for different applications, but it re they really do need to be tailored to the specific position that you're applying for. Another good question I get asked is, who do I address it to? Who do I, do I address it to the principal, Derek Scott? Do I, press it, uh, do I address it to Stefan Muller or do I address it to um, the heads of campus? I think, you know, use your discretion with that. And Stefan, you can jump in if you like, but I think either or, whether it be the head, head of campus or um, the principal, um, you can certainly choose. Stefan, Just what would- Just get it right. You can't address exactly. it to Derek, Mr. Derek Scott, head of campus, because he happens to be the principal. So whoever yes. you address it to, as long as you get it right, and it shows you've done your homework and you don't address it to the wrong person in the different campus, that's absolutely fine. Yes. Thank you, Stefan. Um, we've got here as well, be careful with your particular, particular philosophies about education and, you know, uh, I think um, keep that very short and clear and concise as well and, and we certainly don't want to see, you know, a lot of paragraphs um, around that. Um, do some research on what Halebury's, um, uh, you know, particular philosophies are and tailor your, your cover letter around those sort of things. We have a very particular style of learning at Halebury, um, so doing some really, um, some, some great research research around that uh, will demonstrate your understanding of the way Halebury teach. And that comes back to shape the cover letter to um, the institution and also personalise it. That's right. Excellent. So thank you, Nita. And then there's some quite obvious things like your contact information, VIT registration, or if it's pending, that's fine too. Just make sure that we know that it's in hand. Teaching methods and year levels. Don't hide it on page three or let us go through the transcript of your master's degree to work out that you can teach hums in year eight. Put it above the page break on page one that if you can teach hums up to year 10 and history up to year 12 and uh, geography up to year 12, then make sure that you put that in there because we tend to employ specialists to teach their own specialty in each of the subjects. So make it m more obvious than you think you need to because if we're looking at 90 or so pay, um, applications, the more obvious it is, the better. Put your, your own education history next because 
you are one of the finest tertiary institutions in the country. Why not make a big deal of that? If you've got a good grade average, put it in there. We are a fine educational institution looking for fine educators with a good education history. If you've got it, put it in there. Um, keep your uh, placement uh, history really, really short. We have dozens of placements a year. We know what a placement is like. And so if I see a CV where two pages are taken up with 50 dot points of responsibilities during your first teacher placement, I think you're overcooking it. That is to say, I don't want to see a dot point that you attended team meetings. Of course you attended team meetings because you were told to attend team meetings. I don't want to be reading what you were charged with doing at great length. I want to see a much shorter list of what you've actually achieved. So if you contributed a new resource for the year nine history program in that team meeting, and they're still using that resource on their learning management system, that's what you put in. I'm really not interested at all that you attended professional learning meetings because they were part of every Tuesday afternoon. What I want to hear about is what you achieved and contributed and created during your placements, because otherwise you fall into that trap of telling a school what a teacher placement is like, and we know what a teacher placement is like. So a couple of good questions. Is the one page cover letter too short? Well, at your stage, probably not. If you can get across in there, just how good you are. Uh, if, if I'm not grabbed by the first page, it's a bit like an essay. You know what the essay is going to be uh, at the end of the first page. And then of course you carefully mark the rubric and, and you know, get it all right. But you're not going to grab me on page three if you haven't grabbed me on page one. And there's another question, if we had taught geography units one, two and placement, but you've mainly trained to teach HUM seven to 10. Well, you can say you can teach VCE geography, but give us a flavor of how confident you are. If you can teach VCE geography, but you haven't done very much yet, but you've trained to do that, put that in there, but don't make it up. Do not make up that you're a generalist humanities teacher all the way up to VCE, and then we probe you on 20th century history and you fall flat on your face because you can tell me about glaciers. Be really specific what you're applying for. And by all means, check with Anita that if we advertise for a humanities position, what the subject load is likely to be envisaged to be. And if that's geography to year 10 and uh, BCE history, and that's what suits you, then you apply. Don't waste our or your time as it happens. Good. Great response. <clears throat> Thank you, Stefan. So in, in terms of your application, here are a couple of things um, that we suggest you do. So address the key selection criteria, but only if, it, if this is asked. So if, if um, you go to the Halebury website, um, you will see a, in our um, Halebury Recruiting Great People section, it'll give you, um, uh, there's a section that, that talks to you about how to apply for a position at Halebury. And within that, it um, tells you what we expect. So um, if we are asking for selection criteria, then address it, but for the most part, we don't. Um, focus on your achievements. I think that's a really, really important point to make. Uh, you know, write down your achievements and, um, and really highlight those in your application as well. They're one of the things, again, that are going to stand out in your application. Um, provide a range of, of references. Um, I don't think we need sort of any more than two to three. Um, I, if you haven't been in the workforce um, for a long time, um, a referee within the university or, or two would, would be great. And I think we would even consider a, um, if you had a part-time position somewhere else, um, a reference within um, from, from that, that place as well. Make mention of your co-curricular interests. I think this is also very, very important as it really gives us a bit of a snapshot about your personality and what you like to do outside, um, outside of study. So definitely put your co-curricular um, interests in there as well. Excellent. Uh, and, um, and, oh, go on, Anita, sorry. No, oh, carry on. There we go. No, no, um, so I was going to say, and, and you know, what not to do. Uh, do not forget to add a cover letter. You know, I, we have seen, you know, some great resumes. Uh, if they don't have a cover letter, unfortunately, we don't progress to the next stage. Um, so also don't take up, I think Stefan has touched on this earlier, um, a whole page of dot points with your educational philosophy um, and areas of, of expertise. Uh, so no, do, do not put dozens of dot points of responsibilities in, um, spelling errors. So we, believe it or not, see a lot of those still come through now with experienced educators. And, uh, you know, I have one hiring manager that will not move forward with a candidate if there is 
an error, a spelling error in, in their resume. So please, please, please make sure that you um, spell check that uh, and get somebody else to review um, your application um, to, to, you know, that might be helpful as well. Um, do not worry about the fact that you don't have any teaching experience. If you think that the role is right for you and you have the passion to do it, um, apply for the role. Um, what about date of birth, photo, religion, social media? Well, date of birth, that's irrelevant. You know, we don't, we don't care how old you are. Um, photo, look, some people like to include a photo. Is it really relevant? I, I don't think so. Religion, again, irrelevant. Now, social media, uh, I think, um, you know, I, th I think it's okay to put your LinkedIn profile on your application. People do like to do that. Uh, they like to connect um, on LinkedIn. So I, I would probably recommend putting a LinkedIn profile link on your application or, or even on your CV. Did you want to add and, to uh, that? Yeah, thank you. And, and, and do be careful with other social media. Um, you know, and, and one of our main child safe questions, of course, that you would expect to get during interview, because of course uh, the ministerial order uh, suggests that we must, and we firmly believe that we should uh, check your suitability to work with young people, relates to your interaction with any students of yours on social media. So be very careful. And LinkedIn is fine because it's sort of professional social media. I would say well clear of the others. And I cannot stress enough to get somebody else to proofread it. You cannot, and human neurobiology says this, you cannot spot your own mistakes because your brain simply fills in what is expected, what it expects to see in your own cover letter. Get somebody else to read your cover letter. And this, this thing about philosophy, I just want to briefly get to, because you may have been given a different and, and divergent advice, but just hear me out. Sometimes I see CVs where at the beginning, directly and immediately uh, above uh, underneath your name in the prime spot on the CV, there's a lengthy paragraph about your philosophy of creating a holistic, inclusive, safe learning environment where every student thrives and is fostered to achieve their full potential, which you couldn't possibly argue with, but at the same time, it's almost entirely devoid of meaning for the purpose at hand, because it doesn't actually say anything personal about you. And that's prime real estate on a CV. And I would be very careful to put something that is so nice and bland as to not say anything about you in the bit of prime real estate on my CV. So I would, I would just counsel to keep that really, really short. Having said that, we did appoint a brilliant young graduate last year who did put their uh, educational philosophy there and it read simply every student, every lesson. And that's it. That's all she put. Now, actually, that's really, really clever because it keeps it nice and short and snappy. And it also shows subtly that she'd done her research on Halebury when she applied to Halebury because one of our little mantras is that every child matters every day. Now, she shouldn't have copied that and didn't, but she adapted it slightly to be something nice and pithy and short. So she didn't get a job because of that, but it certainly helped uh, catch my attention when I saw her CV. So um, what are we looking for? We're looking for excellent academic results within the VCE that you may have done or other uh, year 12 leading certificates and your university. At some point, you're gonna have to have shown that you can cut it academically because Halebury, for example, and lots of schools of our ilk is a non-select entry school. And yet over 50% of our year 12 graduates are in the top 10% of the country if you uh, give uh, credence to ATAR as an accurate measure of that. So 90 and above. We want to see a passion for teaching and learning. If you're sitting there because you couldn't think of anything to do other than teaching, you should probably just go and make yourself a cup of coffee now. This is not the right job for you. You need to be passionate and you need to want to grow. We're looking for strong discipline majors. This harks back to this, what, what if I uh, mainly trained to teach uh, you know, history? Well, then that is your strong major. Then you will be, in all likelihood be teaching history here at a school of this ilk. We're looking for experience in other fields. If you've got a long background as an engineer and you're now in your mid 40s and you want to go into teaching and you're learning how to teach systems engineering and physics, that's brilliant. That gives you the sort of applied real world experience that really fosters engagement in the classroom. So that's not a negative. That's not a lack of experience in education. That's a, a massive bonus in education, in, in experience in real life. So make sure you tell us about this. The same with co-curricular areas. We've got a vast, and schools of our ilk, a vast co- and extracurricular program. And if you are a really, really, really passionate marathon runner, well, you might want to tell us about it because we've got a really extensive athletics program that we will want to slot you into if that's where your passions lie. So 
above and everything else, we want somebody who's clearly and self-evidently enthusiastic about the immeasurable privilege of working with young people and shaping the next generation. If that's not you, go and do something else and that's fine too. No one will judge you for it, but that's what you need to work in a sector like ours. Anita, over to the interview process. Thank you, and that was a great overview. Okay, so you have landed your first interview. How exciting. So um, here are some, um, some tips on um, what to expect at Halebury uh, with regards to the interview process. Now, I, pro I can't stipulate enough um, the importance of preparation. So preparation really is key when it comes to the interview process. Um, you may or may not be aware that we have a very robust interview process for our teaching position. So we have a um, a first round, a second round uh, interview. There'll be some classroom observations where you, you're actually required to, um, to teach to a class and, and you are being um, assessed as, as you're doing that. Um, and then the final step in the process is to, to meet the principal. Um, so Derek Scott um, meets every single prospective teacher that comes through um, Halebury, which, um, which I think is fantastic. So prior to your interview, have a really good understanding of who the interview panel is. So you will have anywhere from two to four um, people on that panel and they can vary from people, uh, either heads of campus, heads of department, uh, someone from HR. Uh, so really know who is going to be on that panel and do some research on them. Jump onto LinkedIn and have a look at their background and experience and, and where they've come from. Um, you will be given uh, a summary of the, um, the, the interview process and what to expect so that when you turn up to interview, you have everything that you need to be successful. And what I mean by that is uh, you'll know who you're meeting with. You'll have obviously location at the moment. It is over Zoom. Um, you'll have the time. So you'll know that the interview will last for, you know, 60 minutes, for example. And you'll also be told uh, about the style of interview that is going to be. So there will be some general questions. There will be some behavioural based questions and behavioural based questions um, in itself. You need to really understand how to respond to those. Um, so, you know, looking up things like the STAR approach um, is a great way to respond to, um, to behavioural based interviews. So that's your situation, task, action and result. Be on time for your interview. Uh, you know, I mean, unless there is a genuine reason you've been held up in traffic or something um, drastic has happened, um, really make sure that you are on time. And, you know, if it's a Zoom call, log on five or 10 minutes um, before and wait for them to, um, um, to, to accept you into their room. If it is face to face, get there 10 minutes early because you will be required to, um, to register at, at reception um, and that does take a little bit of time. Dress professionally. So this is an interesting statistic. Um, a, an interviewer will make a, a summary of you within the first seven seconds of meeting you. So if you have one candidate that is dressed in neat casual, um, you know, some, some jeans and, and some nice shoes and a, and a t-shirt, um, and then you've got another candidate going for exactly the same role who is in a suit, um, that perception is everything. So first impressions count. It's really, really important to remember that. Speak formally and with confidence when you're responding to the questions. And one thing I've seen um, a lot of people do is they start to answer the question as soon as it is asked. It is okay to sit there for up to 10, 20 seconds to gather your thoughts and then deliver your response. And if you do that, I ensure you that you will deliver a much better response than if you just start talking about the first thing that comes to mind. If you don't understand a question, ask them to repeat it. If you still, if you're unable to answer it, ask them if, if you can come back to it. Um, don't be afraid to take notes into your interview as well. I think that's a, a great idea. Um, take any notes that, um, that you may want to during the interview process. Um, and then feel free to leave any additional information with the panel as well. Uh, and another great point um, is to have some, some questions. So have some really 
um, relevant questions um, at the end of your interview and, and you will be asked at the end of the interview. Um, you might find that a couple of the questions have already been answered and it's okay for you to say, thank you, I, we've already covered those off, um, but make sure that you have um, a couple of good questions. And one question might be around the culture. You know, can you can you describe the culture of um, the, the, the you know, year eight teachers at Halebury? Or what opportunity is there for me for career development within Halebury? So just, um, you know, that really demonstrates your willingness to, um, to want to work for the school as well. Excellent, thank you. And there was a question just now about the portfolio. Well, look, don't take one if you haven't gotten, but like, like I referenced earlier, if you have contributed a resource to the year nine HUMS team or in your early learning room or in your primary school placement, and you've got a resource that they're using or that really worked for you, why not take it along? Why not have a, a, you know, a little anchor and a crutch to hold on to? And why not speak to it if curriculum content creation uh, or content creation comes up? That's the sort of thing I mean. You don't have to now assemble a portfolio if you haven't got one. But if there are snippets and bits and bobs of the work that you're actually proud of having produced, that isn't just a 5,000 word essay that you go, would you like to read this? Because we won't. Uh, by all means, do take it along. Um, that's the sort of hook from which to hang a, an engaging conversation that I'm talking about. You, you have to prepare, but you can't come across as over-prepared, so to speak, and just rigidly sit there and answer only to what you've thought about. Be flexible and take, take hooks from which you can hang conversations along to the interview. So uh, really quickly there, because I'm, I'm mindful that we're uh, running towards the end of the session here, um, but we've answered some of the ones that you've posted during uh, our presentation. But do you have any questions for us? Please don't do what I've heard some people say to go, how far is the nearest free car park? Or do you provide food? D just don't, okay? It doesn't make you come across as very professional. So here's some of the ones that I've been asked that, that have really impressed me. Now, of course, if I interview you or Anita, you can't use those because I've just told you them. But anybody else, they don't know I'm giving this away. So um, by all means, do, do think about it. And really the best questions are those that get across to us that you're here to learn as much as here to teach. I'm keen to keep learning from master teachers. Do you have a peer observation program? Turns out we do. And then that gives the panel a really good chance to go and talk to it. And they feel like you've actually done your homework on Halebury. Do you have a feedback program for teachers and educators? Turns out we do. I've just seen Tim Grimshaw, our professional learning manager, pop into the session too. And if you have any questions, then I'm sure he'd be delighted to answer them uh, later about our, our very deep and broad um, professional learning program that lots of schools like us in the independent sector proudly have. The sort of thing like, I'm new to the profession. I actually wrote this one down uh, when somebody asked it. I'm new to the profession. So instead of hiding behind it and feeling slightly embarrassed and sort of, you know, thinking you squeezed in the door just by dint of luck, acknowledge it. Tell us why that's a good thing. I'm going to need some support to keep learning and improving because that's what we're really after. Can you talk me through your induction and mentoring program? What does the school do to put you in the best possible position to improve student outcomes? And the thing, of course, is that this should be a two-way process. If a school doesn't have good answers when you ask this sort of questions, you don't want to go and work there because then they will not look after you properly. How does your coaching program work? Does the school offer support for further tertiary study? I've got a master's of teaching, but that's now an entry requirement into the profession. What if I wanted to do an additional university-based diploma on curriculum design or international curriculum design or classroom management or whatever it might be? Do you support further study? If I got this position, what do you feel, panel, would be the greatest challenge for me to thrive at this school? Well, they should know what the challenges are at their school and they should have an answer to how they're helping people to cope with them. Because if they don't, you don't want to work there as an early careers teacher. And this one I really liked, I scrolled this one down too. What does your school value in early careers teachers? Don't hide, proudly bring yourself to it as a newly hatched graduate teacher because you bring unique qualities and, and, and learnings to it. And if they can't answer why they value you, you don't want to go and work there because you're gonna burn out. And that's the sort of question I think that really projects you into the space where we want to see you, the learning, improvement, and prepared space. Um, we're gonna run out of time. We've got one minute left. Uh, and of course, feel free to leave. And if uh, I'll hang around and Anita will too, if you've got any other questions but ask about the professional learning program that they should be delivering. Schools in the independent sector don't have access to the, uh, the, the government sector's very extensive professional learning resources, so they need to be on top of their game and create their own and tap into really, really good programs. Put them on the spot. 
ask about what they do to support their staff in becoming ever better because they cannot rest on their laurels. They have to support their staff in every possible way uh, they can devise. And really most importantly, you are about to do the single most important job in the world. Because whilst there's lots of other important jobs, whilst of course our wonderful medics go and save lives every day, you are the people who are gonna train the next generation's medics and your impact will rumble on and on and on, genuinely, literally through generations. So you should be proud of getting as far as you have and what you've achieved to get here and to be very nearly teachers. Your active choice to contribute to education, the single most important thing that you'll ever do, and most importantly, your student's future. And if you can speak to that sort of thing, then no matter what other technical advice Anita and I might have been able to give you, if you can speak to that sort of thing, you're the right person to work in any school, not just an independent school. So uh, that brings us to 11.45. And now here's the dreaded, do you have any questions for us, even though we've tried to answer a whole bunch of them before. So um, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Taylor, for uh, enabling this session. And if you do need to leave, of course, because uh, that was the advertised time gone, that's perfectly fine. If you do have any questions, by all means, now's the time for the, the Q&A. Uh, and I'm perfectly happy to hang around for a bit longer and answer any you might have. Thank you so much, Stefan and Anita. Um, I think that was an incredible presentation and I'm sure all the students here have got some real value out of it. Um, if anyone does have a question, you're welcome to um, even turn on your microphone and um, ask the question out loud to, uh, to Stefan um, and Anita. Otherwise, you can also pop it in the uh, chat function as well. Um, one question that, oh, hang on, we've got a question here. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know what might be the best way to look for an advertised position for independent schools. Anita, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, definitely. So um, for those roles, that, positions that are being advertised externally, we advertise them on SEEK. Um, you can set up a job alert there, um, but you can also go to our careers page. So if you go to the Halebury careers page, um, you'll see a list of all of our positions, external positions that have been posted there. So that would probably be your, your good starting point. Thank you, Anita. Um, I will just ask ooh, as well. Oh, sorry, just, there you go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there we are. So that's, uh, that's where all the jobs are. And that's where you also find, uh, oh, hang on. I'm on. That's where all the jobs are, and that's where you will also then find uh, things like the expression of interest uh, for sports coaches and the general expression of interest and uh, the job descriptions for every job. And of course, that holds true for almost every independent school worth their salt now, because they would have all by now put in what we call an applicant tracking system instead of just putting it in the newspaper. In fact, the newspapers are probably the worst spot to look for these things by now. We've also, um, we're also advertising on LinkedIn now. So we have job slots for LinkedIn uh, and we, um, we advertise um, a lot of our positions there as well. Cool, uh, so information, what information it says here is provided prior to the teaching demonstration if you're fortunate enough to progress to the stage. Now that's a really important question because I, I, still, I still see schools that appoint on the basis of an interview alone without actually seeing uh, teachers, graduate or experienced teachers, in front of the people, the only people that matter in a school, which is, which is of course the students, not the leadership or anyone else. And, uh, and Henry absolutely insists on a demonstration lesson and we're talking a full demonstration lesson. So not a 10 minute sort of drop in because there's very little you can actually demonstrate meaningfully in 10 minutes. So um, we've done those on Zoom whilst henry has been delivering uh, its entire timetable uh, synchronously on Zoom. Um, we've had demonstration lessons on Zoom and we, uh, are, as we now roll back into on-site teaching, hopefully quite soon, uh, we will have them back on-site with lots and lots of COVID safe uh, provisions in place. And what we then do is for those who progress through uh, from the first panel interview round uh, into the demonstration lesson, we will have the head of uh, department of the relevant subject area that that vacancy is aimed at, brief the candidate on uh, what the students have done up to the point of the demonstration lesson taking place and uh, what the next unit of work will be that that lesson should lead into. And then we give you relatively free reign because what we do want to see is uh, bring you bringing yourself to that lesson and you having a certain degree of interpretive leeway in terms of what and how you teach. Of course, it has to fit in with the scope and sequence that the students have been going through, but we don't want to be overly prescriptive. So we don't just want you to rehash a lesson and then we reteach the students. We do tell you what the students are 
are covering in terms of the curriculum content and the assessment they're heading for. But then we do expect you to teach a, a, a proper full lesson, so to speak. And of course, uh, you are always welcome, in particular if you're an early careers or graduate teacher, to check in a little bit more closely with the head of department. And one thing I really like, and this holds true for anyone, is uh, the most successful people for demonstration lessons um, uh, have reached out to us and asked how many students are in the class. And we can print and, and, and photocopy anything that you might like to provide. And one thing I really liked, I saw this last year, is that a, a, a graduate teacher, in fact, again, had brought with her uh, 23, no, what's, hang on, that's too big, we've only got up to 20, 20 little name cards, because she'd asked, that's 20 students in the class, and she brought 20 blank little name cards, and she said to the guys in the classroom, right, kids, I don't actually know who any of you are, and you don't know me, but I can introduce myself. I would like you to write your name onto this name card so I can address you during this demonstration lesson by name rather than pointing and saying you. Took her 10 seconds, a really nice little touch that established at the back of the room for the panel watching that she was interested in the relational aspects of forming the relational uh, connection between herself and the students by addressing them by name. Such a simple little thing and something really, really powerful. At the end of a demonstration lesson, I always debrief with the students um, to ask them how that lesson went. I almost never ask the teacher, how did the lesson go for you? Because I'm not really that interested in it, because I'm interested in the students. So what I would normally ask the teacher who's just done the demo lesson is, how do you think that went for the students? Not how did it go for you? Because it's the students that matter. Or I might ask them, how do you think that went for Sophie in the third row? Because Sophie in the third row might not have said anything the entire lesson. And I would have noticed that watching from the back. And I'd be really interested to see if the teacher doing the demonstration lesson wasn't so wrapped up in themselves that they actually noticed that Sophie in row three hadn't said anything the entire lesson and wasn't actively engaged in the learning. And the best answers I've ever had was the teachers, and they're usually graduate teachers because they're so attuned to the students' needs, who said, I think that went really well for five or six kids who were actively engaged, but I was a bit worried about Sophie in row three, because even though I asked her direct to, directly a couple of times to contribute, she seemed really withdrawn, and I wonder if she's okay. And of course, they can't know anything more about Sophie in row three, because it's only one demo lesson. But it's that focus on the student that is all important, not on the teacher, curiously enough. Sorry, long answer to a short question. That was a fantastic answer. Thank you, um, Stefan. Um, we might have a time for sort of one or two more questions. Here we go. Um, uh, I'm an international... Oh, yeah, Ollie, go for it. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation today. Um, a bit of a big question, big picture question. I'm entering teaching from a prior career and I'm still making up my mind about whether the, uh, which sector is going to be right for me. Um, and forgive me if this might seem as a provocative question, but it's something I am concerned about with the independent sector. Um, what do you see as the influence of neoliberal policy in uh, Australian education? And what do you think this means for um, the ability of students to access excellent education, regardless of their background circumstances? Ah, look, that is a big question. It's a really important question. It's a question we must not shirk from. You know, we have to have an answer to this. And, uh, and forgive me, uh, Taylor, if I'm speaking Halebury specifically for, for just a second here rather than for the wider sector, because if one thing I've learned is that the independent sector is not one sector. It's a deeply disparate collection of very, very different interests, um, all the way from, from the, the, the religious schools with their particular approach to education and life to uh, non-affiliated institutions like ours and, and, and any others in between. Halebury is really best characterized, I suspect, as a private school with a public purpose. We take our responsibility to serving the communities in which we live and in which we work extremely seriously. And, uh, and of course, look, you know, it's no secret that we do get funding uh, from government sources uh, and that we charge relatively high school fees. Having said that, um, the way that we've structured our operations is that we are a non-select entry school. We will take any child and we're not selectively academic and we are extraordinarily proud of the individual progress that every child who joins our school makes and a huge amount of our government funding goes on to uh, bursaries and scholarships uh, whereby we support those who otherwise wouldn't be able to access a Hillary education um, uh, in so doing. We, we even have a, a staff giving um, program whereby staff can, uh, can salary deduct 
uh, and it's a very su uh, successful program. And it's now, it's only been running for three years and it's funding two full scholarships to Halebury uh, for students who otherwise would have no means of coming to, coming to the school, where we can do a, a tax deductible salary, uh, a pre-tax salary deduction to contribute to our scholarship program. So we are acutely mindful that we have a responsibility to not rest on our academic laurels, to be leading education, both philosophically as much as materially, and to not skim the academic cream, so to speak, though I hate the phrase, of the demographic uh, top, if you like. We take that extremely seriously. Does every school? I don't think so uh, in our sector. And there are some that are resting comfortably on old money, um, but I won't name them, of course, because that would be inappropriate. But Haderby would much rather fund a new campus and grow and take over the biggest indigenous boarding school in Darwin because it was about to fold and walk the walk and put our money where our mouth is than simply rest on waiting lists. There are some schools who are single campus who will proudly tell parents when they turn off on open day, we've got a really long waiting list, so good luck getting in here. And they somehow feel that that's a sign of progress or a sign of exclusivity. Haderby hates waiting lists because waiting lists are upset parents who cannot give their, pa their students the sort of education that Haderby enables and works very closely with lots and lots of other schools to enable them too. The rising tide lifts all boats, I reckon. And, uh, and we don't like waiting lists. We'd rather grow. And some people disagree fundamentally with that. And I won't get any more political than that. Uh, there's one question here about international students who didn't go through the VCE and whether that would impact uh, the strength of teaching. Well, look, it depends. Um, the VCE is just a certificate. Uh, it, it's a year 12 certificate. It's a good one, but it's just one of the many year 12 certificates across the world. What I'm interested in is how well you did and how well you project yourself going forward, no matter what your opportunity has been so far. So I don't care what your opportunity was, I care for how much you made of it, because the same holds true for our students. I don't care where they come from and what language they speak at home and what cultural and ethnic and, and religious background they're from. I care for what they do with what they have and how we can best help them to do that. So if you're the right person, no matter what country you're from, no matter what educational and religious and ethnic background you're from, if you're the right person for that job, for our students and our staff at that campus, in that moment, in that subject, Job's yours. Thanks, um, Stefan. And there's just one other question here um, about international campuses um, and how to sort of approach that process there. Ah, yes, I missed that. Uh, th that's really fascinating because we love our international engagement. You know, we've got lots of the usual international engagement you know, the trips, because we're, you know, drawing on a wealthy demographic, you might cynically suggest that, well, of course, the kids can go to trips to the Galapagos. Yes, we do that too. But much more importantly, we actually are one of the most diverse schools in Melbourne. People don't often think that, but when you get to sit in our senior school assembly in our Keysborough campus, there's 65 different national and ethnic backgrounds assembled in the hall there. We really proudly are truly multicultural, and instead of just engaging internationally by having international students come to us, because we have only very few of those, we actually want to deliver pathways and opportunities abroad. So we run uh, many programs for local students across Southeast Asia, including two schools. Now, the recruitment to those schools is a much more bespoke, individualized thing, because, of course, there are labor and employment and visa regulations that apply, for example, in China. And graduate teachers, of course, unfortunately, still are excluded from working in China until you've got two years worth of uh, experience under your belt, because they're trying to exclude backpacker teachers, uh, so to speak. So if you are interested in working uh, for our international operations, that's then a direct contact with either Anita or myself, and we'll talk you through it. Or if you are an existing Hellery staff member or you get a job here, um, then uh, by all means, talk to us about uh, a secondment to, for example, the China or the Darwin campus for two years, whereby we then maintain your position here at Hellery. So we are doing lots and lots of work in the, uh, in the workforce mobility space. And it's a really interesting one, but it's a much more bespoke sort of uh, conversation because it, it involves transnational relocation and uh, and that's exciting but it's slightly more difficult so that's a uh, uh, an individual reaching out mid-year for a term three start when would be the best time to submit an expression of interest well look any time really the expression of interest uh, are monitored uh, as an actively managed talent pool by anita so in fact i don't know why i'm talking anita i'll throw it to you Thanks, Stefan. Um, so yes, that is exactly right. So um, 
you know, feel free to submit your um, expression of interest anytime. Um, at this particular time, it is, um, it's, it is quite busy for us as we go into um, our 2021 season. Um, but, you know, for a, a term three start, um, you know, feel free to submit your application as you see fit. Thank you, Anita. Um, it's right on 12 o'clock. Do we maybe have one more question from anyone in the audience at all? No? No? Well, thank you so much, um, Stefan and Anita. This was um, an incredible session. I think um, all of our students have really gained a lot of information um, and a little bit of confidence as well for their future careers. Um, I'll, I'll grab a side.